All right, got a special guest today. His life revolves around family, soccer, and business. He owns his own clubs. He owns his own indoor facilities. He has his own tournament business, and he's involved heavily in the turf business as well. That man is John Newman. What's up, John? How are you, Ryan? I'm good. I'm glad you were able to join me today. To give you guys a little bit of a background on John, uh, when I first met John, it had to be what, like seven years ago? I think it was 2013. Eight eight years ago. Eight years ago? Yeah, seven. JD was just born, yeah. Yeah. So seven years ago, eight years ago, when I met you anyway, you were coaching. I was fresh off Red Bull. I was figuring out if I still wanted to play. And what was that team? Like a semi-pro team? What was it? Central Jersey Spartans. Central Jersey Spartans. PDL team, right? PDL team. So... That's where I met John first, okay? So he was just coaching then. And then that was literally the last time I played soccer. I, I stopped playing soccer, I opened my gym, and then literally seven, eight years later, he calls me. He goes, Ryan, John Newman, I just moved right around the corner from your gym. Can you train my son? So he comes into my gym, and I'm like, what's up, John, what are you doing? How's coaching? He goes, I don't really, I coach, but that's not my main focus anymore. And then he goes on and on about all these businesses he's gotten into. And I was basically mind blown because it hasn't been that long and his life drastically changed during that time. My life revolves around soccer, business, and family, and so does his. So I'm glad I can have him on here. And um, the, basically how I want to start this off is um, talk about, you know, what was your original goal? Was it to be a high-level coach? What was yeah. the start? When I came here in 2002, yeah, I'd finished playing soccer back in England. I was playing for Bolton Wanderers as a youth player. Then I was playing at Shrewsbury as a young pro. Then I played at uh, Southport. And then a bit of a dilemma about what I was going to do. So I got into coaching when I was about 20 years old. I was doing some work at Everton. And then I came to America. One of my friends was working for UK Elite. I came over here to work for UK Elite. And it was to see whether I liked coaching. Um, I started coaching for them. And then started going down the path of getting all my qualifications and my goal at that stage was uh, to try and go on because I never made it at the high level of playing soccer was to go on and be a, uh, a professional coach. So by the time I left you in like 2013-ish, what sparked the change for you from maybe not focus so much on coaching, but still coaching, but focusing on business as well? I always, I always had a business, so when I, uh, in 2002 I started with UK Elite and then I worked for them for two years, so till the end of 2004 and then in 2005 I, bought, I was part of a company called Just Soccer, so I worked for them in 2005, 2006 as one of the, the owners, I was a small percentage owner in that and then at the end of 2006 I um, decided that I really didn't want to be part of that no more. So, I spent a bit of time finding what I was going to do. And then in 2007, I opened a company called Advanced Total Soccer, <clears throat> which was a training business. And it was, it was basically uh, me and another guy. Um, and it was a, an avenue for us to carry on coaching in the US. Um, obviously, with visa paperwork and things like that, you had to get hold of. So, it was an avenue for us to carry on coaching. We started there. Uh, Advanced Total Soccer back then, 2000, 2007. Um, so I always had that when I, when I, was, when I met you in 2013. Right. So um, Advanced Total Soccer was basically, um, you know, started in 2007. And then in 2013, um, 2014, um, Advanced Total Soccer changed there. My, me and my business partner at the time, we split up went on different paths and at that stage I was the guy that for advanced total soccer and the clients that we had we had a lot of clients we did, I was the guy that was the soccer guy behind it I was the guy that yeah. went and done all the sales meetings but talked about soccer wrote curriculums wrote coaching manuals wrote my first coaching manual in 2010 after passing my UA for A license I was the youngest coach in the US in 2008 to pass the NSCA master coach. So I was chosen by one of 10 people in the country to do that at that, at that time, which was the equivalent to the American Pro License 2008 and started and finished 2009. 
So my job at that stage was was to for advanced total soccer was to write all the curriculums. Then in 2010, while still owning advanced total soccer, I got the job as the director of coaching at Princeton. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I had two jobs. I was the director of coaching at Princeton and I ran my own company. And then obviously I met you in 13. And then in 14, advanced total soccer, me and my, as I said a minute ago, me and my partner split up. So it was a time then that it was, well, what am I going to do? Am I going to keep advanced total soccer going or am I going to go down the coaching path? And I thought, you know, I've done put seven years in already. So then I started learning about business. You know, I went to a, a guy called Bill Asdale, who's probably the only, one of the biggest mentors I've ever had. He was a, a small business guru based in Chester, New Jersey. And I basically did a, um, a degree with him over three years in small business. So from 2013 to 2016, I learned everything from bookkeeping, accountants, budgeting, budget versus actuals, how to write contracts, mm-hmm. all these different things that you need in small business. So I spent, you know, from 2014 to 13 to 16, really, you know, focusing on how to become a better business person. So, you know, then I got offered a job um, I see the stars when I was still at Princeton to go in and do the academy uh, with Tab Ramos at the time and Wayne Galloway. Uh, and then I got offered the job on PDA. So I'd done one year of PDA with my good friends, Jerry McEwen and Sam Mellons in the Development Academy in 2015. Yeah. And it was a long, long, hard slog, the Development mm-hmm. Academy, four nights a week. I was still a director of coaching at Princeton. Right. They allowed me to do it which was awesome at the board at that stage. And then um, I was still doing my business. But then after the end of the first year of the Development Academy, I decided that I just didn't have the time to do that, to run Princeton and to do my own business. So I made a decision then, 15 going into the 16, that the business was going to be the focal point of what I was going to do. Um, So... 2016, end of 2016, um, I started looking on, I'd done basically an online, offline business degree and decided how I was going to now take ATSC Advanced Total Soccer to the next level. So in 2017, I bought uh, my first company, <clears throat> which was called Sewn Soccer, which was another trading business. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I bought that off now, my really good friend. Andy Soames, you know, in the April of 2017, no, the April of 2016, I bought that business off Andy, which is the first business I bought, you know, and then that helped my training business at Advanced Total Soccer ATSC jump from 30 members of staff to close to 80 members of staff. Jesus. Yeah, so <coughs> bought that business off Andy and then, you know, basically got the taste then of what I was going to do next. Right, and then you kind of got addicted to it a little bit, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it's the feel of business. Yeah, I got the, I got the, um, when, we, when I done the first one, it was, it was, you know, I'm, I come from a council estate uh, in England, Liverpool, you know, I grew up, my parents worked really hard to give us everything they got, I didn't come from, you know, money and background, so every penny that I earned over in America, I always put it away and I saved up and I always had, some money so I was fortunate enough to buy a business and then after I bought the first one I was like this is okay works <laughs> out so <clears throat> in 2017 I um, bought a net then I then that was the that was the trading business I bought my first club which was uh, New Jersey Wildcats mm-hmm. so Kevin who ran the Wildcats for a number of years um, decided that he was uh, needed help because obviously there was, the market was going different in the, in, the youth, in the youth soccer world. So I ended up coming with a deal with Kevin and I bought New Jersey, Wild, New Jersey Wildcats. So I owned the Wildcats and I was still the director of Princeton. So I went to the, to the, to the, to the, uh, to the board of Princeton and um, I put a proposal in front of them guys about how we could take the club on further and further. The things that we were missing in Princeton was that um, we basically always rented facilities, we never owned our own facilities. So I sat down with the board um, in 2017, 
started talking to them about a way of that. Obviously, the board was a non-for-profit board. They were all had jobs. How we could now turn this over, the club that, that I'd worked in for 10 years, to turn that over to, to myself and my assistant, Ollie, who works with me. Um, and basically then we merged the Wildcats with PSA, so we become PSA Wildcats mm -hmm. and PSA Princeton. So um, I basically took on the club uh, and I signed a contract with the club that I would take on the club and I would build facilities for the club. Mm -hmm. And that was part of the reason I was able to take over the club because obviously the non-for-profit board, it's difficult for them to get facilities or be on loans for facilities and so on and so forth because it's a non-for-profit board. So I took it upon myself that I would do that for the, the, the kids of Princeton here, the kids of Princeton and for the rest of the club. So I bought the Wildcats in 2017. Um, and then my good friend Andy, who bought my first business off, Soma Soccer, he decided that he'd had enough uh, of the soccer world with STA in Morristown, which obviously is a very uh, prestigious club, he'd done a fantastic job. So I was able then um, to uh, buy STA. Mm -hmm. So now I had two clubs. So bought STA in Morristown um, in 2018, took over the reins. August of 2018 and started the buyout in late fall of 17, purchased in 18, you know, going into the 18 19 season, 19 20 season, yeah. You know, then at the same time, I, uh, another deal came up, you know, up in Bergen County, you know, another really reputable soccer guy, Ashley Hammond, again was coming to the, he had the, you know, 35 years plus in the business, his kids are getting older, he wanted to watch them do different things. His son was um, getting into the US national team and the Paralympic team, doing really well, Che, so he wanted to spend more time. His younger son was doing, you know, doing really well with the cross, he wanted to spend more time. So I was helping Ash with some soccer stuff, so I ended up buying Ashley's soccer camps, which was basically a, um, a business up in Northern Jersey that came in with, with ATSC and then obviously the club SDFC. Yeah, so then we had our third location for Princeton, which is called Princeton SDFC. And then we had another training business, which which went in with ATSC. So yeah, in a short period of time, I'd gone from having ATSC and then multiplied ATSC and then having no clubs that actually owning two clubs that had four locations in them, you know? Mm -hmm. So you have the two clubs, right? Yeah. ATSC, you have the indoor facility, ISP. So, so what happened in the... Um, in 2018, uh, I'd been, STA had been renting the um, ISP for a number of years, and then uh, I'd been renting space there and running events there and doing different things. So uh, Jeff, uh, another good guy, good friend of mine, he had uh, been running the business for 17 years. He offered me an opportunity to, to buy the building. So it was a no brainer for me because uh, basically, um, I was spending a lot of time in there, doing a lot of different things in there as a business. So in October of 2018, I purchased the building you know, to own, you know, ISP, which is a 17 year old, 17 year old business. It's a hundred thousand square foot premium indoor facility mm -hmm. in Northern Jersey, which homes STA. And then it also homes a lacrosse program called Steps. So that was that. Yeah. While I was going through that process as well, I uh, got into the tournament business. So I started a company called ISE in 2017 after I bought uh, some soccer because they had tournaments. So I got into the tournament business. I hired a guy called Stuart Smith you know, to come in and be the CEO. And we took ISE from three tournaments to now we have 20 tournaments and we just merged ISE with another company called Sports 11, that way is in Delaware, Mill, and, and, and uh, Scott's my partner on that. Yeah, now we run tournaments from New York all the way down Delaware, Virginia. So you just kept adding on these balls, huh? So yeah. You the PSA, SDA, then the indoor facility, then the tournament business, yeah. and then most recently you just added on, you got into the turf business as yes. well. So Elite Turf USA, which is my newest yeah, business which has just been started in 2020. Yeah, so when I took over, but I, as I talked about before with the Princeton, part of the thing was to build facilities. So 
In 2017, I started looking at how to build facilities and how I was gonna do it, yeah, what it needed to build facilities, what type of turf was out there. Uh, started taking trips around the country, went to Georgia, because the home of the turf is in Georgia. Yeah, looked at different companies, and then the back end of 2019, um, I found a company that I was very comfortable with uh, to start building the facilities for Princeton, um, which is called a company called Act Global, which is the biggest uh, provider of turf in the US, as a uh, turf in 90 countries. The, the turf that they have is quite unique. Um, there's no black crumb rubber. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we're very <clears throat> conscious about players' health, the environment. The turf is uh, recyclable, so the back's recyclable. Uh, and the turf is, is woven turf, uh, which regular turf is tufted turf, so it has a longer life span. The turf sits on a pad, and then the turf goes on top of it. Now it's infilled with sand, silicon sand, and the, the creme de la creme, which I think is, is amazing. The performance part is ocean plastic from the Pacific Ocean, so 1.8 million bottles get recycled to put into the performance of the, of the field. So when you put all these things together, it's unbelievable. So during this process, not only building my own fields, um, I seen that there was a real market for this type of turf in, in, our, in, our, in our area due to the fact that that, you know, the crumb rubber, um, like it or hate it, you know, people are very conscious now about the health and about right. all these different things, you know? Mm -hmm. Recyclable turf compared to non-recyclable right. turf. So you know, I decided, in 2019 that I was going to start a business and go into business with that global to be their partner and distributor in six states yeah so then I we uh, as I was doing that I brought on a guy called Moshe Grant with me who uh, basically built the field so me and him went into this together and then we brought on another guy called Greg Adams uh, to help us with the distribution and sales and marketing side he has a pharmaceutical background He's helping us part time and uh, do that stuff while he still has his other his other job and Moshe is still doing his other job and I'm doing my job. And um, now it's been launched. It's called Elite Turf USA. Yeah, you can find everything on our website. But we've already yeah done significant sales mm -hmm. in the in the marketplace and uh, people are loving the loving the turf. You know what we did as well, which is which is quite unique. And I'm really proud of this is um, Princeton, we're gonna have two fields um, and we did a deal with Princeton Sacred, Princeton Sacred Heart and Princeton that we were gonna work together as partners that Princeton and the school were gonna put these tear fields in together. So it, it gives back to the school and right. the same with the Rani School in Monmouth. Mm -hmm. So there's two fields going in in Princeton, they'll be both in in August. One field in the Rani School will be in by the end of this month and the next field in August. So Princeton will have four of its own fields and I'm working right now up in Bergen County on another project for two fields for Princeton SDFC. So by the end of this year, Princeton will have six of its own fields. And then I'm working on a project in modest time now to build a complex of four fields for STA. So my two clubs by the end of this year will have 10 of their own turf fields, which is state of the art, you know, all FIFA certified, which is very important in our game. You know, and everything is recyclable and you know, good for the good for the world and, and good for our players. So as I've gone through the journey, I've always looked to add to things with my experience of what can I add. And the turf business for me now is um, adding because basically I have three and a half thousand of our own players between Princeton and STA and we're growing. We're opening new locations again this year for STA. It'll be coming out soon. Um, we're growing, but part of the growth is you need your own facility. So it's a natural thing for me is to partner with the best people and build my own facilities to be in it and not just hire somebody to build the facility right. who really doesn't care about the players doesn't really care about what it is and just buy regular turf you know, I spent three years finding the best turf that mm -hmm. was out there two and a half years to find the deal that I wanted uh, for the players you know, the, the most important thing is performance for the players and how they do it and I believe this turf is the best one yeah, it's all amazing I mean so when I first met you you were climbing the coaching ranks trying to anyway, in 2013. Seven years later, you now have all these businesses. You have your clubs, you have your indoor facilities, you have your tournament business. 
you have your turf that you're involved in now. Who knows what you'll do next? So you're basically a full-blown entrepreneur. And it seems like every kid, not kid, young adult these days wants to be an entrepreneur. Like the new cool thing is to be an entrepreneur. And always hasn't been, always hasn't been that way. But now everyone, it seems like, wants to do that. So like, what do you think the best part of being an entrepreneur is or you know, owning your own business is? What do you think the best part about that lifestyle? I'm sure there's a lot of challenges as well, obviously. You know, it's, I, at the beginning when I, I turned from the coaching to the business side full time, I was doing 80 hours, 90 hours a week. Mm. Still coaching, still running my businesses and I'm still coaching three or four teams at the time. Uh, you've got to put the, the dedication in at the time. The, the best thing for me is I have great staff around me. So when you're building any business, you've got to have good staff. And you know, I have great staff around me and I've been able to pick good people out to, to help me with things. And um, for me, the, the, my business is all evolved around sports. You know, again, my background when I was young was all about playing soccer and being an professional soccer player. So I'm quite fortunate that um, I've been able to do a lot of my business in the world that I love. You know, being an entrepreneur, um, it has its challenges. It has sometimes, it has its ups, it has its downs. You know, but once you figure it out and you get to a, a place where you're comfortable and you're comfortable in yourself and you're a good person, um, I think good things happen, you know. Um, it's enjoyable, it's enjoyable giving people jobs, it's enjoyable giving people opportunities. The most important thing why I do it is a heart. I'm still a, I'm still a little kid that kicks a soccer ball around the field. So I want to see my players, mm -hmm. my own children, you coach, right? I want to see right. them have the opportunities. My parents who worked really hard for me, you know, had when I was younger. I want to see them have the same opportunities, you know. And, and that's that's the that's the big smile on my face. Hiring people, giving people opportunities in the business. We have a fantastic coach education program at, at Princeton and STA and ATSC I'm massively involved in that stuff and making better people but also better human beings and we're trying to do that with our kids within our soccer programs it's not just to be good soccer players but better human beings have models and, and that's the important thing you know there's certain businesses and certain people entrepreneurs and, and do certain things that cannot affect people yeah, my business I have the opportunity in, in the soccer world to three and a half thousand, four thousand players on the, the on the club business, ATSC. ATSC is high we, we dealt with thirty five thousand players a week. Jesus. Right? So a few years ago we were thirty five thousand players a week, we're probably at about twenty one thousand players a week now. So the message we can get across to them people and my coaching staff as long as we do a good job is is to help people and, and give the kids a good opportunity. That's what I like about my stuff. Um, again, being an entrepreneur, I don't even look at it as being an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I've never, I look at it as just trying to do better for my family, right. better for my kids, better for my family, better for my family back in England. And I've been really, really lucky. I've had good people around me. My wife supports me, what I do. Yeah, again, I've had a good mentor in Bill Asdale and Ed McCarthy, who are two of my really good mentors. And I've got good people around me. And, uh, I'm very lucky. But, yeah. Uh, I work for it. Absolutely. I work. I still work 60 hours, 70 yeah. hours a week now. <laughs> yeah. I'm still coaching. I'm, still, I'm not coaching as much you know, because of the facility stuff. But, you know, I enjoy it. Good, good. So you mentioned in there, you know, your upbringing. Like, that's what really made you who you are today. And for those listening, you were born and raised in Liverpool? Yeah, born and raised in Liverpool, yeah. Okay, so like, describe your upbringing a little bit. You know, talk about, you know, your childhood you were football 24-7, I'm assuming? So I was, I was born in Western Hospital, 20th of February, 1980, I just turned 40. Uh, my mum and dad, working class people, I, I lived in a, in a council estate all my life. Um, my dad worked at Ford Motor Company, he was a manager at Ford Motor Company. My mum was originally a cleaner, then went back to college to become an uh, auxiliary nurse. I had an older brother who's seven years old than me, an older sister who's eight years old than me. Um, so um, growing up, obviously I was always the youngest. So where I grew up, I lived on an estate where there was 700, 700 houses. You know? So I grew up in a tough, tough area where, you know, as a young kid, you got yourself into a lot of scrapes and bruises, you know. Uh, people 
where I grew up, it was soccer, and through soccer you go into a lot of fights mm-hmm. because if you right. win or you lose, and that's what happened in my upbringing. And then I started playing on a, on an older team when I was six years old. My dad was a manager of a team. We were ten. Mm-hmm. Um, went for the first year and watched them play. And I was still young, but at seven I was playing on the U eleven team. Mm-hmm. Um, it was called Lickers Lane, that's where the, the estate that we lived on. And played with the older kids, played that for a year. And then at U8, I went and played for Wiston Juniors. So Wiston Juniors is, in our area, is one of the, is, is the, pre, is the club that's produced a lot of professional players, top players, Stephen Gerrard, England captain, Liverpool captain, Joey Barton played over there, Lee Trundle, the list goes on. Um, so I played over at Wiston, I played up a year, at U9, so we played in the U10s, me, Steve and Gerard, a couple of other boys, we played up a year at U10, U, uh, U9s, played up at U10. Then at U10, we had our team. So from the age of U10 to U12, uh, our team was the best team in Liverpool. Mm-hmm. Uh, we lost one game in two years. We went to Holland, we won the St. Michael of Gestel tournament in uh, 1992. We were all 12, we won that St. Michael of Gestel tournament, we beat uh, German teams, Dutch teams. We ended up playing the Liverpool team in the final, actually. As mm-hmm. you know, Celtic, we beat them 2-0 in the final. Um, so it was 24-7, go to school, come home, play soccer, train, kick the ball in the back garden, um, go down the road, play, pick up games, as you call them in America. We just call it street soccer, where right. from. Play, and, and um, that was it. Then at U13, at U um, I got offered a, a trial to go to Bolton. I was at U12 back in England in um, 1992. That was when you were allowed to sign schoolboy forms back in then, which is now the academy system. Mm-hmm. You weren't allowed to sign forms before that back in them days. Now you're allowed to sign forms at seven years old. Right. So in 1993, I, I went to Bolton. Um, Jimmy Jusnit was the scout that looked at me. Uh, his son, Neil, ended up going on to be the academy director at Evan for years. So uh, Jimmy took me to Bolton, I signed for Bolton when I was 13 and I played for Bolton until I was 16 I was made captain of U14s. I, um, I was the captain of 14s, 15s and 16s. So I lived in Liverpool, Bolton's about 35, 38 miles away so I had to get picked up from school four days a week uh, by my mum and dad. You know, four o'clock, 3.30 school let out, we were on the road by four o'clock, straight up to Bolton. Train four days a week. Training usually starts at six o'clock, had to be there five thirty. Train at six o'clock to eight o'clock, drive home from Bolton, get home at nine o'clock. Mm-hmm. My mum and dad had to change their whole life around to right. take me there. So very thankful for them what they did. Um and that started my career in soccer really. Um we, we played in a league with Liverpool, Manchester United, all the best clubs, Man City. Man City were a big club at the at the time then. Uh, we played in, in the North West League. They, um, I had some, some great times playing there uh, at Bolton. And then at uh, 16, Bolton didn't offer me what I wanted. Uh, they offered me a one-year apprenticeship and an extended, an extended schoolboy forms, which means um, you had to go, you could stay at college as well as playing soccer. I didn't want to do that. So um, basically, I finished up with Bolton and in, uh, they told me in February what they offered me and I was, I was carried on to the end of the year, which was the June with them. But from February, I went on, out on trial at different places and I got offered 11 apprenticeships. Mm-hmm. I ended up taking an apprenticeship in Shrewsbury Town. Uh, so at 16, I had to move away from home. So Shrewsbury from Liverpool was an hour and 45 minute drive, mm-hmm. um, just by the Welsh border. So uh, I moved to Shrewsbury in August of 19, uh, sorry, in June of 1996, June 15th, I left. I did two weeks of pre-season training until July before all the pros and I came back and then I started down the soccer path. So I left, I left lived in Shrewsbury as an apprentice. Um, and then there was a first, I was, uh, first year I played in the reserves about 31 times. The Shrewsbury were in the uh, first division at that time, the old first division, which would be the, um, played in the, no, they would be in the second division at that time, because the second and third division. So as a 16 year old, I played in the reserves 31 times, got around the first team, training with the first team, second year apprentice, played in the first team in the pre-season friendlies, um, played again lots of times in reserves. And then at the end, didn't get 
the contract that they offered me to stay on, I wouldn't have been able to afford to live in Shrewsbury. So right. um, I went back home, signed for Southport, um, moved out of home again. So I went back to mum and dad's, got myself a place, played at Southport for a year. I uh, played in the conference, played in the first team as, as an 18 and 19 year old about 25 times. Uh, got to the FA Cup fourth round. Uh, got beat by Leighton Orient. We beat Mansfield and people like that on the third round. I was 99. And then uh, I came over here to play for uh, a select squad from Nosley in the Dallas Cup and I got offered like seven scholarships to play over here. Mm-hmm. But I wasn't uh, academically at that stage ready to go to college. Right, university. Right, right. went back. Played more non, uh, non-league stuff, age of 21, sat down with my dad and my dad said, listen, he said, uh, why are you getting paid each week to play non-league stuff? You need to look at what your career is going to be because it's not going to be professional soccer. Mm-hmm. You've been out the game for a little bit, it's not going to be that. So he said, my dad, I'd done my prelim coaching badge when I was um, about apprentice at Shrewsbury, which was part of the FA's mandates. Um, and then I basically done my UA for B license back then, and then came here in two twenty in two thousand and two. And that's when it all started, right? The coaching. That's when it started the coaching full time. But the upbringing where I was from again, my my mum and dad working class people. You know, give me and my brother and sister everything that they could and afford. You know, we never had a car. We never had a car until I was eleven years old. You know, yeah. You, know, you know, I wouldn't be anywhere without my parents. They 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 yeah, they stood by us. Stood by me, my brother and sister, no matter what we did, if we were naughty or whatever, and they always, you know, supported us. But we guys, again, I come from humble backgrounds. I come in a, a council house, you know, two up, two down, mm-hmm. home back in England, you know. So, yeah, I'm very thankful for the upbringing I got. It made me the person I am today. Yeah, made me focused, made me uh, uh, have a good head on my shoulders. Yeah, never take anything for granted. Always have to fight for what you want to get. Yeah, give me the drive and the passion where I am today and that's what I want to try and instill in my kids. Describe England as a football nation for those that have never been there. You know, I've been there once. I was 12. I went on a, you know, typical trip. Saw Arsenal, Chelsea, went to Anfield, went to Old Trafford and that was so long ago and I was still blown away. All I knew was this. Yeah. You know, America and it's not even close in terms of atmosphere and it's whatever. Your life. So in Liverpool, there's two teams, right? You've got Liverpool and you've got Everton. And they're what, across the street from each other? Yeah, across Stanley Park. So um, I grew up with Liverpool and Everton fans. So my dad's one of six brothers, my mum was one of ten. And my, one of my dad's brothers supported Everton. One of my, uh, two of my mum's brothers supported Everton. So you know, even our family, <laughs> yeah. it wasn't all Liverpool, it wasn't all Everton. So, you know, Liverpool and Everton fans, why we live and breathe together, we get on. But when the derby comes, we hate each other. Yeah, Liverpool's a bit of a unique a unique city because we have two football teams. Manchester has two football teams, but you go 35 miles down the road to Manchester and Liverpool people, they don't get on because right. there's, there's football. You know, it's it's a, it's a culture, it's, it's a religion. You know, we go every Saturday to watch the game and people are passionate about it. You know, there used to be a lot of football vans back in the day. Have you ever seen Green Street Hooligans? Yeah. Is that, how, how true is that? <laughs> back in back in the early ninety eight late eighties, early nineties, there was a lot of football violence. Yeah. You know, um, you still see it every now and again now. No it, it it's you know, it's not what you want to see. Right. All that was about was people who support each team decided that they were gonna prove that Liverpool could fight Manchester and Manchester could fight London and, right. and so on and so forth. And you know, there was back in the day there was doctors, people who were, you know, blue collar people, there was People who are business people, they go to the football to fight against people. But growing up, you know, we grew up as Liverpool fans to dislike Manchester United. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm 40 years old now and uh, not that I dislike them, I don't want them to win any games. Right. That's, that's just the way we are. <laughs> I know. Right? <laughs> uh, we grew up to dislike Everton fans, but obviously when Hillsborough happened, the, the two clubs came together after the disaster of Hillsborough and Liverpool, you know, some of my best friends are Evertonians, but on that day, Liverpool play Everton. You know, I would never, ever be in a pub when I was, you know, 19, 20, if I wasn't at the game or whatever, I would never be in a pub with Everton fans. There'd be Liverpool pubs with Everton fans. They wouldn't, we wouldn't together. It's still like that now. Um, it, it's intense. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, 
I love the American sports and you go tailgating, you can't tailgate where we come from. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. You, you don't go tailgating, you know. Um, there's security, there's police. You get off the train to go to an away game, the police meet you at the train station and they walk you to the stadium and after yeah. it still is like that now. When I went to the, I went to, a, I, think, I think it was the Chelsea game I went to. I'm 12. I had the shirt color of the away team. A Nike t-shirt. My coach freaked out. He said, you need to go to the store right now and buy a Chelsea jersey because I don't trust anyone here. I don't care if you're 12 and you're American, you don't know. They don't give a shit. You know what I mean? It's, you know, I was just back, I was just back in England a couple of weeks ago for my 40th birthday and I took one of my good friends, Greg, uh, to Anfield for the first time. We played West Ham, we won 3-2. And uh, he was blown away by, you know, he was blown away about how how people are and how intense they are about it and people love people love the sport it's 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 getting here it's getting that way here in america you know my kids love liverpool they, they sing all the songs you know and um it's getting there it's, it's a different culture i think in america when you're brought up there's so many sports football basketball mm-hmm. soccer the different seasons you know i remember when i when i came in in 2002 you know Soccer was just a fall sport. There wasn't many right. clubs playing in the spring. You know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. So you do a lot of work in the fall, and then you were, and then in the spring it was more kiddie stuff and that. And now to where the game is today, where it's a full year round sport, and you know the set eighteen years I've been here and how much it's improved. And now you go, you see it on, uh, you know, CBN, um, NBC Sports every right. weekend. You see the people. That no, I mean it. when I grew up, you couldn't find the game on TV. I had to, I had to go to Hoboken. Yeah, I had to go to Hoboken. And I ho- there was a guy in Hoboken who there was a Liverpool supporters club, at, um, and they basically showed the games on Saturday nights at eight o'clock. So if you ever wanted to watch Liverpool, you had to go to Hoboken and watch the game at Mulligans at eight o'clock. It was a, re- a replay. Wow! I used to go there. Yeah. I used to get on the train from Morristown or get up there and go there. Couldn't go every week, but I used to go at least every other week to watch the replays. Mm-hmm. You couldn't see the games over here. Crazy. You know, you couldn't you couldn't get them. Now you can watch the games every day live. It's brilliant and it's and it's great. Well, growing up again, as I say, the soccer, yeah, only sport we played at school was soccer and we played a little bit of cricket. That was it. You know, you don't, you don't have football, you don't have tennis, you don't have basketball, you don't have any of that. It was soccer. Everything's around the football. Everything's around football. So, like, speaking of USA versus England, I mean, you spent half your life in Liverpool, half your life here, roughly, going back and forth. What do you think the biggest differences are? You mentioned some of them. Why are we struggling, meaning U.S. soccer in general, and, like, what do you think needs to change? Well, you know, my biggest concern for the federation, the the U.S. federation, is everything's the same. So the federation determined to the academy clubs, if they're the so-called best clubs now, they they determine to the academy clubs how they want them to play and all this stuff. The FA in England doesn't deter to the academies how they play. Everybody in America plays four three three, mm-hmm. right? Yep. It's the same. Yeah, you're trying to create individual soccer players, individual excellence, or we're trying to play create robots. Big difference is there's over a hundred professional clubs in England. Hundred over a hundred. Back in the day, it was ninety six. Now in the football conference, I think there's another fourteen, fifteen clubs. So you're looking at a hundred and ten, hundred and eleven professional clubs just in England. Well, England is the same size as New Jersey, give right. or take. Yeah, <laughs> right. So, in that country, it's the same size as New Jersey, give or take. You've got 110 professional clubs. Out of 110 professional clubs, they, you know, each year at 16 years old, they take eight players on, nine mm-hmm. players on, whatever, they, you know, whatever it is. And they start them kids in the academies now at six years old, training them. So, when you look at that and then you look how big America is, and I think right now, I think the US is up to 50 professional clubs with MLS and USL, which are all year right. round, 50 clubs now. But then they have the draft, and only so many kids go in the draft. It's mind boggling to me that a country so big has half the amount of professional teams that England does. Yeah. And again, because there's so much money in soccer in England, you know, the television deal now, the Premier League, $4.6 billion. Um, the clubs get that money, they put into the academy systems to run an academy back in England. Liverpool, they're just building a new academy for 50 million. You know, how can people compete with that television money? So right. again, I think there's a lot of aspects. One is, I think the Federation are trying to mandate too many things and are trying to go down a path that, are, in my opinion, 
Um, and this is just my opinion. Um, everything's the same. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like the development academy. I like the boys. I like the girls. Um, but they should not do the same things. You know, the professional clubs are doing a good job in our area. The Red Bulls and Philadelphia Union. Now they're doing Philadelphia Union doing a, you know, housing for kids and schooling for kids. But again, is at sixteen years old, you can break into the into the game in mm-hmm. England. You know, right. at sixteen, you leave school, you can be an apprentice. The guys are still got to be at school at eighteen here. Yeah. They can't yeah. break into the game. It's only very, very new that there's kids now at eighteen going into the professional game. Yeah. So again, I think why I think education is really, really important. Them kids that go to college at eighteen and you've mm. been through the process. Yeah. You can you can adhere to this. You know. You're really intense through the month of July, August, September, October, November, mm-hmm. and then it's finished. Yeah, I mean, I went through the system. I went in the draft. I went four years college, taken in the draft, joined the Red Bulls. So I've been through it. Like, there's no way, if you want to be a high level soccer player, that you can go to college. Yeah. 18 to 22, that's the is. key. And you're literally playing soccer for maybe four months, yeah. and that's it. Well, you look, you look. Now I know there's a pilot scheme that there's some clubs in uh, universities in North Carolina, that, you know, in the uh, ACC are doing a full year pilot. Yeah, they're trying to. Yeah. Trying to, right? But you look, there's a kid now at Liverpool called Harvey Elliott, 16 years old, just left school. He's played in Liverpool's first team twice this year, FA Cup twice and the, and the League Cup. So he's played in the first team three times and he's played, he's been on the bench a couple of times. He's playing U23 soccer at 16. Right, he's around Mo Salah, right. <laughs> Roberto Firmino, all these top top players, Mane, Jordan Henderson, Virgil Van Dijk, every day now training. Every day, there's another kid at Liverpool called Nico Williams, eighteen, around him every day. At sixteen, the guys here are still going to school. Now I'm not right. saying education is not important; they're still going to school, so they've still got two more years. He's already training with pros, right, and in games them. Six days a week, 50, 48 weeks a year, 47 weeks a year. And then, the times that by twice compared to a 16-year-old boy here. And then at 18, when them boys do go with the men in the college game, they only play for four months. Then they have to play 20-plus games in four months, which ruins the body. And Absolutely. we've had that conversation about you, how you were tired at the end and right, your yeah. body... Ready was ready to shut it's down. It's almost literally impossible to make it through a college season healthy. Yeah, it's impossible. almost impossible. And, and so, while the college system and the education is a massive part of it, and listen, I left school at sixteen, I had GCSEs, and never went back to further education until I came here to do, as I said to you before, my business stuff, and I went down the soccer path. You know, at sixteen, I was done with education. Why? Now it's a different back home where the the kids are still in. When their apprentices are still doing the stuff, yeah, they have to go to say nights a week. It's part of the FA mandate. It. Um, but every day they're training. They're in the weight room. They're training. It's a job. It, here it's not a job. Mm-hmm. There's certain kids now. You've got your Tyler Adams and your players like that. Right. Do the Red Bulls. But it doesn't happen enough. And again, you know the best players in the US right now are not in the US. They're all in Germany. Right, they're all gone. They're all gone. No one plays here. No one's here. All the best kids are leaving at eighteen and going to Germany and stuff. And you know. Christian Pelosi, who's probably the best US player right now, he left at 13 to go to Dortmund. So there's really... Claudio Arena's son's there now, right? Yeah. Dortmund. Dortmund. They're, they're all over in Germany. Germany have got a, a deal with the US players. Because obviously, to come to England, the US players, unless they have a passport, they've got to play so many international games and mm-hmm. so on and so forth. Well, the big, the big thing for me is, I think the development academy, the standard's really good. I watched it, but every team plays 4-3-3. They play against each other every time. It's right. not the game. You know, you play in the Premier League, you play at international level, everyone plays different, right? They have to be in different situations. So I think the, 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 the federation have to stand back and they have to trust the coaches. Um, there's a lot of things going on in the federation now and the coaching licenses about how they want the players to be coached. Yeah, I could talk to you all night about that, right. whether I like it, whether I agree with it or don't agree with it. I agree with some of it, I don't agree with some others. Um, I've been through the UEFA badges. Um, you got assessed on coaching in UEFA. If you wasn't good enough, you, you failed. That's not the case here. Now it's got a lot computer based and being able to do projects. That doesn't solve the player's problem on the field. So we can speak about that all night. 
But I think the biggest things are the federations, where they're going with the young players. Mm-hmm. And I think at the age of 18, the college system, mm-hmm. right? As you just said before, no good player, no the best players in the world go to college and, and play at that level. No. Now, the US is, I think, if I'm not mistaken, and I could be wrong, I think US has got about 21 boys now over in Germany playing, 21 young players. Mm-hmm. They've got a couple, a couple of other places in Europe. 21 players. Yeah, it's not, it. not enough. That's it. That's, not, that's, that's, it. That's, that's, <laughs> it's not enough. Like, even, they're making small strides, but just, you know, not big enough. You've got, you got players that are still getting called up for the under-20s and the under-23s in the US who are college players. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Man, I remember when I was in college, um, the U-20 World Cup roster, say there's 28 kids on it. 26 played college. You know what I mean? Now, it's less. Maybe it's eight. Yeah. But there shouldn't be any. You know what I mean? It's, I think, you know, again, I think they've got to change some of the rules as well in the MLS uh, about homegrown players and make sure that you have them. Germany did a fantastic job of it years ago and a lot of homegrown players come through in Germany. I think the US has got to look at that. Yeah. But again, there's got to be more clubs for players to go and play at and have competitive games because the clubs, the country's so vast and I know they're putting money into it and I know they're trying. Again, um, that's for a country that's so vast with so much resources. Yeah. I'd like to see it fast forward a little bit. I know. You know? Um, but they're getting there. I see it when I come here and, and I see players now. And one of the big things, which is the big, big things, and same with my son who's eight years old, you know, everything's constructive. You know, people don't, like when I grew up, they don't go to a field and meet and play uh, and they don't kick a ball around. And I, where I live, and I live in Wall, and I've, I've never seen a kid <laughs> kick a ball down the street. Right. I've never seen a kid on the road. Right. Where I used to live in Morristown, never seen a kid, uh, Bridgewater, never seen a kid kicking a ball. You could drive tonight, tomorrow to my estate, and you could drive down my road, you'll see 20 kids kicking the ball. Right, right, right. And I think, you know, some of them things that are instilled in kids, and I hear everything's very constructive, like my son plays on the team and he trains with you. And the reason he trains with you is because it's not constructive, it's technical and it's all that, but it's not like he's just going out and doing that by himself. He comes right. home and does it. But I feel as though everything here is, you got to go with the coach, you've got to do this. Of course. When I was a kid, yeah. My dad was the coach, or Ben Mack was the coach. You know, Ben McIntyre was Stephen Gerrard's coach for four years. Mm-hmm. Stephen Gerrard was the England captain, the pool captain. Right. From eight to twelve, you know, Ben was one of our another. He was one of our coaches. who was just a dad, right? You know, <laughs> not with an A license, right? And all this right, stuff. right. So, so I think that's got to improve, and I think I think um, I think there's too many mandates, and I think there's too many rules and regulations. Do you ever see it happen? Do you ever see us catching up as a world power in football? Not right now. Not right now. I, I hope so. Yeah. No, I live it and dream, live it and breathe it here. Yeah. I hope so. I just, I, I don't see it. Look at the right. women's game, right? The women's game is here. Yeah, well, more World Cups, more Olympics than anybody, right? But they're getting caught. Already. I know. Already. How long has it been? Eight years. Eight years and they've already got pretty much caught up to it. The under-16 US national team, yeah, went two weeks ago they played in England they played Spain in the first game they got beat by Spain 3-1 to one or 2-1 to one in the first game in England it was in a tournament then they beat England 2-1 to one and then they beat Denmark 7-0 um, again it's an 8 year old sport over there mm-hmm. like when I when I grew up girls never played soccer they played volleyball um, right. they played uh, t- uh, not volleyball they played netball mm-hmm. Now, kid, the girls play soccer, the clubs, the professional clubs, they do the same. When I was just back home a couple of weeks ago, I was watching, went to bed, watch match of, match of the day of a Saturday night, and people don't know what match of the day is. It's the, it, on BBC, it's all of the games that go on at the weekend, it's like a replays. Straight mm-hmm. after that, they had the match of the day women's. I watched Manchester City play Chelsea 3 <laughs> all draw. It's televised everywhere now. The, co- the country's got behind it. The, fi- the wow. federation they got behind it. They put money in. I know England got beat by the US the other night 2-0. But in the younger age groups, and we've got some fantastic women, you know, look at what Carly Lloyd's done over the years, and mm-hmm. Alex Morgan and them players right. in the women's game. But the younger kids are getting caught in the women's yeah, game. Yeah, man, they're making more of a big deal over there. You know, they support them as professionals. They support them 
like think about it, if you get drafted by Sky Blue here, it's almost like a downgrade, meaning if you play for Rutgers. Because Sky Blue, they change it now, they partner with Red Bull or whatever, but Sky Blue played at Rutgers. Yeah. So say you played at Rutgers, a lot of the Rutgers girls get drafted by Sky Blue. Yeah. Now you're playing for Sky Blue in front of less fans than you played for at Rutgers using a crappy locker room that's not part of the school. Yeah. How are you supposed to feel like a professional footballer when that's how you're treated? You know what I mean? The, the, big, the big thing is, is, again, over here, you buy franchises, right? Everything's run to the professional clubs. Now, every club in England that has a professional women's team, now the Premier League clubs, that's just a couple of years old. You know, there was five and a half thousand people, I think, at the Man City-Chelsea game for the women's game. Mm. Fantastic. Absolutely. Right? But that's two years old, the women's premiership, or three years old. Yeah. And now they've got thousands of fans going. It's live on the telly in England. You've got the, the professional clubs putting money behind it. Now, I don't know what they're doing over here with the selling rules. I know a few years ago that, you know, the, 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 uh, the league got the money for selling players. But in England, they sell players to make money, and that's how they keep right. it going. I think that's part of it as well, you know. If, it's, it's a business, you know. But again, like the women are getting caught. The US won the 17 national team in the same tournament. They lost heavily. Mm. Heavily, the boys' side. They got beat by England heavily. They got beat by Denmark heavily. They got beat by Spain heavily. Wow. Like, really heavily. They got beat by Denmark, like, 7-1. Jesus. So, again, <clears throat> why they're putting all this structure in place, Denmark, the size of Denmark, compared to the size of the US... Now England and Spain are, you know, superpowers and talk, right? And I told you about the game. Like, I trained a few girls from PDA. Yeah. And their team, they're both 8th grade, ninth grade. This team is probably the best girls team at PDA right now. They haven't lost in, like, three years, four years. They play the boys' teams, beat all the boys' teams. They just went down to the IMG, whatever that was called. International, International Champions. Championship. They played, they played Barcelona. They beat everyone, got to the final, played Barcelona. And... I think it was like three minutes in, four minutes in. I got to show you this goal. Barca gets the ball in their own box. They must have strung 17, 18, 19 passes in a row all the way down and scored. Yeah. Like ridiculous. Like in, you got to see this goal. Like world class, playing in, playing out. Like playing like the de- defensive center mid had like three girls on her back. Right in front of her own box. Center back still played her feet because yeah. she trusted her not to turn over. And she played it back out. You got it. It's unbelievable. Bar- Barcelona, I went there years ago, and their curriculum is very, very, very simple. They pass, receive, move, and they do so many unopposed technical exercises mm-hmm. as the warm up, and then they get into small box exercises, five versus two possession exercises, and then they get into small sided games, and they do it all the way through. And if you can't do what they do, then obviously you have to go to another club. And that's how they train the kids. And it's from six years old. So you've seen the plays they brought through in years. Now they're doing exactly the same with the girls. Nothing different. So what you're talking about there is watching Javi, Ilias, their Messi back in the youth teams back now. That's what the women are doing. It looks exactly like that. And it goes for 10, 11, 12. But, but over here, you've got the Development Academy doing one thing. Then they're fighting with ECNL doing another thing. And then mm-hmm. you've got USYSA doing another thing. Not all together, all fighting for the same players, all telling each other everything's great and it's all rosy on this garden because we do this and it's all rosy on this garden because we do that. Where in the countries, there's one league, there's a second league, there's a third league, there's a fourth league, and whenever you're good enough, you play. So if you're good enough to play a Barcelona's girls team, you play a Barcelona. If you're not, and then you play for Villarreal or whatever it is, or even Levante or whatever the second division, third division, it's over here is. You got the DA fighting for a portion of the girls' side. You got the ECL fighting another portion, and you got the USY. So, jeez. So everyone in, internally is all fighting for, for the different right. things. Like you're talking about that girls team. I think there's another girls team that haven't been beat as well, a year older than them, and ended up playing against Paris Saint Germain in that tournament. And Paris Saint Germain smoked them. Mm. You're looking at countries that have only started three or four years ago with young professional girls teams. Yeah, just wait 10, 15, 20 years. You know. Right. All right, so let me get you out of here on this. Let's just do a rapid fire round. You're born and raised Liverpool. You love Liverpool. <laughs> I'm a Manchester United guy. All your kids are Liverpool already. It's, it's ridiculous. So let's just go Liverpool really quick. 
What was, can you remember your first time at Anfield? Like going there, the experience? Yeah, yeah. so it was back, back in um, about 1988. It was my first trip to Anfield, I was eight years old, got in the spine cop. So it was standing at that stage, you used to get there, there used to be a, a queue around the, around the cop to get in, because it was a general admission only, so you had to get there, the game was three o'clock, you were in the queue at 11, so you were queuing like four <laughs> hours before. Jesus. And then at the sta- that stage, you had uh, adults and kids, so I used to go with my dad at the time, my uncle, a couple of friends, go in the cop, sit on the, the barrier. Um, then, 1990, I got my first season ticket on the cop, and then two years after, the. Uh, it was 92, they took the cop down and came all seats to stadiums then. Holy smokes. Where were you when in Instable, they were down 0-3 and they came back and won it? Where were you when that happened? I was happened? in Mulligan's Bar in Hoboken. <laughs> I was, didn't have tickets to go to the game, I couldn't get to the game, so I had to work. The day after that, I um, couldn't get it off, so I was in Mulligan's Bar. Liverpool went 3-0 down, I yeah, called me dad. My dad was back in was back in Liverpool. You called him while was down while they were down three 0 Three 0 called him at half time. I said, "What about that? Dad's a massive Liverpool fan. Watched them win the European Cup. Been to three European Cup finals." Um, we were just talking. I was in tears outside Mulligan's bar. Went back in, and then we started the comeback. When Ster- when Gerard scored that first goal and he threw his arms up in the air like, "Come on, boys!" <laughs> the whole place <laughs> yeah. in Mulligan's erupted, beer everywhere. Oh People my shouting, god. Jumping. And then Vladimir Smyser put one in the bottom corner. <laughs> Gerard goes through for the penalty. And Gattuso pushes oh. him over. And Alonso takes it and the keeper saves it. Dida, and you're like, oh! yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he scores the 3 3. And then. Shevchenko missed. And then Shevchenko, Jersey dude, that saves one with his nose off Shevchenko. <laughs> at that stage, when he saved that from Shevchenko, who's probably the best centre forward on the planet at that Absolutely, stage. Absolutely, no doubt. Mm-hmm. Him and Crespo, who, who terrified Liverpool in the first half, probably the two best centre forwards on the planet. I'm like, well, you got a chance here. And then it went to penalty kicks, and Jamie Carragher, I always remember Jamie Carragher, the camera was on him telling Dudek to do the, the hands and the legs, because mm-hmm. Bruce Groblad did that in the European Cup final, and he had, Dudek did it, and he saved three penalties. Oh so, yeah, uh, and then after that was a bit of a blur because I'd had a few too many beers <laughs> uh, after that one. <laughs> What about more recently? Where were you for the uh, last year? I was the there. Barcelona comeback. Oh, Barcelona! The Barcelona, was Barcelona comeback. I was, I was, yeah, I was here in my living room. Yeah, Liverpool. What was that like? Three 0 down. Um, just watched the game by myself actually because uh, we were three 0 down and we really didn't give it much chance. So three 0 down and I watched it in my living room. Um, and it was unbelievable. Pulled it back to three three. Three, three, pulled, we were three 0 up. Pulled it back to three three in aggregate, and then that quick free kick by a quick corner by Trent and Origi scores. I was over the moon. Well, Liverpool scored first. Origi scored first. We were obviously Salah was injured in the game, so everyone got was injured, couldn't play. Everyone was like, "What's going on here?" Origi scores, and then Wijnaldum comes on as sub and scores two in the second half, and then Origi scores the fourth. So I was, I was by myself, and then my wife came home later on with the kids, and um, that was awesome. And then I went to Madrid. <laughs> So I went to Madrid. You went to the final? Yeah, I went to Madrid, yeah. So it was uh, one of the best experiences ever. I wasn't inside the stadium mm-hmm. for the final. I was outside the stadium. Uh, I never got a ticket for the final. So I was there with my brother, uh, my uncle, a couple of friends. My dad couldn't make the trip. Uh, we got there a couple of days early. So the day of the final, I was in a square with, with 80,000 Liverpool fans. There was singing, dancing. Yeah. We had some technical issues last night, so the last five or six minutes of John's interview actually got cut off. So I'll just fill you in on the last few things that we talked about. So he continued to talk about the Champions League final from last year in Madrid, where Liverpool took the crown. As you know, John, born and raised Liverpool, he bleeds Liverpool. Like, he's not one of these fake fans out here. His entire life revolved around Liverpool. So when they won the title and him actually being there, he said it was one of the greatest moments of his life. And he just describes it in detail, the atmosphere. So I'm kind of pissed that that got cut off, but he was just over the moon that day. Um, So after being so positive with him about, you know, taking down Milan in the final um, a handful of years ago, and then last year, the comeback against Barcelona and then winning the final in Madrid. 
all positive stuff. So I decided to bring up, being a Manchester United fan, the Gerrard slip. When it seemed Liverpool was finally going to win the league, and then Gerrard had that unfortunate slip that gave up a goal, and the trophy literally slipped through their hands. He wasn't very happy about that. Um, obviously, that day he was crushed. And he mentions a few times in the podcast um, how close he was with Gerard growing up, being there, you know, raised in the same area, they're the same age. So in the youth system, they came up at the same time and played on the same teams. So he knew Gerard personally. So he was crushed that that's how it went down and to all people to happen to Steven Gerard. So he was upset about that, but we moved on. We moved on quickly from that topic. And then lastly, I wanted to go really recent, and I was like, what are the, you know, main reasons for Liverpool's success, you know, over the past, you know, year and a half, two years, this run they've been on? And he, he was like, you know, they just had this, they had the same team almost every week. They've been very fortunate, you know, with their health. Um, every week, it seems like they're, they're lining up, you know, the same. You know, you have Van Dyke. Gomez, Allison, Arnold, Robertson, and then you have, you know, Henderson, Wijnaldum, Fabinho, and then Mane, Salah, and Firmino. Like every week, you know, you watch these other clubs, they almost have to rotate like 16, 17 guys. You know, you bring Milner in, you, you switch out Gomez, you know, every now and then, but, you know, you bring Keita, but besides that, like they're, they're been very fortunate with their health and they've been very consistent you've noticed recently a little bit of slip in their, in their form um losing to atletico and then um you know losing to who was it watford and um you know henderson got hurt allison's now out so you know these past couple of years they've been very lucky with their health so they've been super consistent and then how I ended it was, I wanted to know, because Liverpool has an absolute massive game um, this Wednesday in the Champions League in the second leg against Atletico. So I asked him, what is your prediction for this Wednesday? And without hesitation, he said 3-0 Liverpool, which would make it 3-1 on aggregate and Liverpool moves on. And he goes, you know, when, those, when that bus pulls up to Anfield... That bus is going to be hit like it's never been hit before. And what I mean by that is, like, when these buses pull up, the Liverpool fans find out, find out the route of the bus that it's going to take. So they line the streets with, um, I don't even know what they're using. It seems like fire and stuff like that. And they're chucking it at the bus. It's a scene that you've never seen before. You would never see it in America. And supposedly they're changing the bus the bus route, so to keep the Atletico players safe. But supposedly, according to John, that information has leaked and people have, people have already found out. So that bus is going to be getting stormed by Liverpool fans. The minute they walk into the arena, the soccer fans will be singing from the very beginning all the way to the end. That's the biggest difference that he said. Um, he's been to the Bernabeu, he's been to the Camp Nou, he's been to all these Old Trafford, he's been to all these... Um, stadiums. He's been to Anfield a million times. He goes, that's the biggest difference. They sing and yell the entire time and they don't stop. So, and that's why, you know, Liverpool's been almost untouchable at home over the years. He said that's why the atmosphere is absolutely insane. So that's why he thinks on Wednesday, 3-0 Liverpool and they advance. And then I asked him, you know, what what happens if they lose? That that's kind of like a even though you won the Premier League, you're gonna win the Premier League, you know, getting knocked out that early in the Champions League, that's gonna leave a bad taste in your mouth, you know? And then he goes, If you came to me back in August and you said, John, you know, by March you're gonna be twenty five points clear to win the league, but you're gonna get knocked out early in the Champions League, he goes, I would have shook your hand right then and there and taking that all day long. He goes, you know, we won the Champions League last year. 
We haven't won the league. You know, that's the one we want. So to be 25 points clear, which is insane, you, they might break the points record. He goes, I would take that. So he's hoping for a win on Wednesday, but he's ecstatic that they're finally going to take home the league. So we pretty much wrapped it up after that, after a quick little Liverpool talk. Um, so that was basically it. You know, we started off talking about, as you know, going from a player to coach to full-blown entrepreneur and, you know, all his businesses being, you know, all revolved around soccer, you know, so he loves what he does and, you know, maybe it didn't turn out the way he wanted, but now he has four beautiful kids. He makes millions of dollars a year, has a beautiful home and, you know, what more could you ask for? And he basically, you know, being an entrepreneur, you control your own life. So like like I said, like he'll take random trips to Liverpool. He'll go to the final. Say, say Liverpool makes the Champions League final this year. He'll fly out and go to it because, you know, he's in control. He set himself up, you know, with the success he's had as an entrepreneur all around soccer. And then, you know, we talked about his upbringing, you know, the differences between England, you know, living in Liverpool and then living here in New Jersey. And then, you know, I just wanted to wrap it up with Liverpool talk because who doesn't love Liverpool? I'm a United fan. I hate Liverpool. But Liverpool is the hot team right now and everyone wants to talk about them 24-7. I hope you guys were able to get some value from this interview. I thought it was very interesting. You know, since now my main goal was to be a professional soccer player. It didn't work out. So now I'm becoming, you know, more of a businessman now. You know, an entrepreneur trying to grow my gym, trying to grow my brand you know, again, all revolving around health and fitness and soccer. And I, I've seen what he has done literally in such a small window of five, six, seven years and how much success he's had. I thought it would be great to get him on here and tell his story. So that's why I did it, why I did it. So I have a lot of respect for John um, and how far he's come already. He's a super interesting guy. He has so many good stories. And he's so, he has such good tips. He's always willing to help me out and give me advice, whether it's on soccer or business. So it was great to have John on. I'm kind of pissed that last 10 minutes of Liverpool talk got cut off because there were some good, you know, little things in there. So, but again, I hope you guys enjoyed it. And um, I'll see you guys next week. Have a good one.